Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Dan Chen, and uh, I'm a software engineer at Google for 11 years, and uh, I've been working on the Kubernetes project for four years. Before Kubernetes, I'm working on the Borg, the Google internal uh, uh, infrastructure, the internal container orchestration uh, 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 for f seven years. And many of the you know, maybe you already know the Kubernetes. It is based on and derived from the Kubernetes uh, from the Borg. So, so I'm honored and also very uh, pleased to see the honored and pleased to see the container technology emerge emerging, and also very happy to see Kubernetes grow so much since then. So today, together with Jen Yu, my coworker, and we are going to talk about the container isolation technology uh, at Google. And, uh, and I'm going to start on the container isolation technology and uh, uh, how we Google apply those kind of technology and uh, chronologically. And, uh, and also Jen Yu is going to talk about the sandbox technology. And also at the end, he will introduce the, the exciting project uh, GVither, the Google newly open source the project uh, sandbox solution. So, so in 2013, Docker released its container engine, and uh, at that year, there's the millions of the downloads and about 8,000 Docker image being pushed to the registry. Now the technology is uh, real; it has been really take off. And a recent container security survey uh, uh, conducted by the enterprise strategy group shows about 40% of the company are using containers in some way. And the Docker also uh, uh, reports there's the over 29 million downloads. So in Google, we have been development container technology and using container to manage our applications for more than a decade. So Every week, we launched over four, me, four billion containers. Why, people, why do people like the container technology so much? I think it is because of the, uh, its performance, isolation, repeatability, quality of the services, accounting, and uh, visibility. Containers are so amazing. Are there still any, are there any concerns and issues? Actually, we all think about the security uh, concerns still remain. Uh, the same survey conducted by the Enterprise Strategy Group shows 94% of the company feel that container negatively apply, affect uh, security. So during the last decades, Linux community developed a lot of the work on the isolation uh, mechanisms. There it include uh, namespace, C group, capabilities, true, setcom, and also several sandbox solutions based on the Linux security modules. Now I'm going to briefly introduce, uh, to talk about uh, how Google apply those content isolation in our production uh, chronologically. So Borg was born at uh, 2004. Before that, and uh, there's the other orchestration system uh, in Google. Majority of the, most of the Google production workload was or allocated to the dedicated machines. Some of them even run as the root. So what that means? It means those user space process have full access to all the device nodes on the, node, on, the, on the system, and have full access of the host file system, have, and potentially they could uh, consume all the resources on the node. And also they can do reconfig of the network stack, and uh, they even can perform any kernel calls and uh, send a single kill to other process on the node. So what if anything goes wrong in this model? For example, a bug in a script, in a script which run the RM uh, command, at least here, 
And because that uh, variable is undefined, so you potentially kill everything, remove everything on the systems. Or there's the vulnerability or malicious software could be access of the slash bin and change the program and that slash bin and or mess up the files and the slash etc. Or maybe make the node it is unbootable. So this is obviously is bad. So nothing shield of your system. And so we change the orchestration and enforce by default all those workloads and the uh, majority of the work to run as the unprivileged user, except the minimum set of the demons on the node. They want to perform some administrative the tasks. With this change, all those, uh, those user-based uh, process have limited access to those devices and include a network device. And they have the limited access of the host file system. And also the performance of the run, those kernel calls are going to be, will be checked before executed. And also the process cannot send a sick kill to kill the random process owned by different users. Okay, so, but, if those processes still have potential, could have the uh, uh, potentially dangerous of the capability. For example, they still maybe could uh, uh, set UID on the files if they have the cap set UID capability, right? So they still could open a raw uh, socket and if they have the cap light raw capability. What that could happen? So in Borg, by default, we drop, we force most of the capability or dropped by default, except, but the user, the, the could request, the job could request uh, particularly of the capability and uh, uh, to perform particular of the tasks. So, so we pretty much drop all those of the administrative of the capability for majority of the jobs. So we, be, we really truly believe or feel capability has the better isolation. And uh, luckily today at Borg, uh, at, sorry, at the Docker and the Kubernetes, also majority of the capability has been dropped except those uh, those capability were uh, in, uh, defined, predefined into white list. So, with that change in the book, we are okay with the privilege isolation. But what about resource isolation? Think about abusive user, and they using they try to use up all the available memory in the system. What could happen? It could and uh, cause uh, so the kernel and uh, too busy with of the reclaim try to free off some pages and before it is kill some process on the to 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 recover of the node and during that process everything on the node is going to go slow and even eventually some of those work will be killed by kernel so how we res resolve that problem we apply c groups and uh, up to limit account for and isolate the resource usage of the containers. So we're using those kind of things in the book since 2007. And when the first C group uh, to be the first C group concept is being, being pushed to the Linux upstream kernel. So using the C group, we, we control the what container can use but still container can see all the processes, network interface, mount points on the system. What can we do? And so we apply the naming spaces. And we use naming space to control what uh, container can see. So naming space provide the fundamental of isolation to, uh, to the container. So there's the, the, for the each, there's the suite uh, so they provide the isolation for different of the naming space type. And currently, in the Linux kernel, there's the seven different naming space being supported. Network, PID, mount, user, IPC, UTS, C group. And there are more to come. In. So, so now we are using naming space to control what a container can see and using the C group to control what a can, container can use and run those containers as the unprivileged, uh, to, unprivileged to control what it, they can pre perform and what, can, uh, what it can execute. Is that enough? So then what should 
from the red height uh, uh, said at uh, 2014, containers do not contain. So Linux, uh, Linux development community deploy, uh, implement uh, several alternative ways to configure fine control the access to fi fine grant access control and using mandatory access control. And the top two most popular ones are the SE Linux and AppArmor. And also Linux community de de deliver Statcom to the way to restrict what a being associ uh, associate of the container to restrict it what kind of the system call can perform. So even with those sandbox uh, solution delivered, uh, the lit Linux native sandbox to, uh, solution delivered, and still we may have the still have like the vulnerability and uh, exploit uh, in the Linux. So for example, the most recent example, it is because containers share the same Linux network stack, and there's the vulnerability. So a single more formed packet from a remote can crash the kernel. And there's the more, like for example, the dirty call caused by the risk condition and uh, in the system, and also the spectrum and the meltdown. None of those can be prevented by the Linux native of the sandbox solution. So since uh, uh, Jenny is going to talk about more on the sandbox, so I'm going to leave that for him to comparing the sandbox solution and other hypervisor based off the solution. So, but why with all those kind of the solution still, we couldn't uh, management, we could provide enough of the container association on the node because the reason it is they all share the same kernel and which have a large attack surface, expose those kind of things to the vulnerability and also external. And also they share the same device driver and uh, also, and the secret accounting is not accurate enough to provide in resource isolation. Like the, for example, in the KMCG being a release in the kernel 3.8, we have that kernel issue and because mischarge of the kernel memory usage and cause a lot of problem, isolation problem, on the especially resource isolation problem. So now I'm going to hand over to Zheng Yu, talk about all the sandbox solution and the include of the GWether. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chen Yu. Uh, I'm one of the tech lead and the co-founder of GVisor. I'm really honored to actually talk about the GVisor today because uh, we started work on, like, uh, on this project like five years ago. Uh, it's really glad like we have, uh, as a container fan, of course, uh, we, we've been uh, trying so hard actually to improve containers and trying to actually fix, uh, I think is the most important problems for containers. So let's come back a little bit as a developer, as a container fan, uh, what I really want to do, right? I just wish an image I put from a random corner of the world, like I, I just want some, run something, right? I don't want to explore my Linux box because that's only my only machine. And I don't want to do a lot of work uh, for example, I want to like write a full uh, AppMO profile or actually figure out what exactly this uh, system calls actually this app is making. Of course, I don't also want to like motivate the application, but otherwise what's the point of Docker, right? So I also, the other side of the, uh, the wish is basically I want still feels like a container. Uh, I want to stop like immediately. I also want to cheap to run. I want to run a lot of them on my really cheap laptop. Oops. So on the other side, uh, as a security engineer, I know I need more than one security layer, right? Between an untrusted workload and my Bitcoin wallet. Uh, the principle is really simple. There's no single compromise can steal all of my coins. Surprisingly, this is the same principle we use in Google, all right? We just replace like Bitcoin wallet as a production job and the coins is just user data. Uh, this is exactly the principles when we actually designed the sandbox and actually to provide some security protection for all the production uh, workload. Uh, let's rethink a little bit about the container isolation. Uh, what does container really mean, right? What's the interface uh, for containers? A lot of people actually, some customers I've been talking to don't really know what's inside a container. 
they've been assuming container just like it's a hermetic uh, thing, like including every binary run. But ironically, it doesn't really include the kernel, uh, which is the most important part. Uh, the interface to containers is the system call. Uh, let's just keep that in mind. We can come back later. There are some Linux fun facts. As Don mentioned, Linux is a really, really, uh, I mean, huge system, I would say. So look at the lines of code in this kernel. Uh, how many lines they, I think Linux developers are great. Uh, I think the thousand developers all around the world uh, actively writing the code, which is great. Uh, however, if we look at the attack surface, uh, there is like over 300 like native syscalls just for one architecture. Uh, if you look at the CVEs, like over 2,000 CVEs uh, since 1999, and uh, 200, over 200 of them actually can result in privilege escalation. Uh, actually, I've personally downloaded those like privilege escalations and analyzed them. I found like 80-ish uh, exploit actually online available. So um, I can come back to that because there is uh, some interesting uh, observations. Uh, okay. Then there's a, a little bit of background uh, concept I want to give you guys. You might see this picture uh, in Keynote today. Uh, the key message I want to deliver here is like Sandbox actually has, it's an overloaded term, all right? So it has so many millions in computer science, uh, in like the software development is basically in your environment to build uh, like a deployment or develop your application. But the sandbox I'm really talking about today is just a security layer to reduce the attack surface to your host. And somebody also think like sandbox is actually can protect the application itself from a compromised host. For example, some like some work like mini box, like SCON, uh, those works use ACX, but that's out of the scope of this talk. We'll only talk about how we actually actively reduce the attack surface of the host. Uh, Okay, let's recap. Uh, since Don also talked about AppMO, SCNUX, SACCOM PPF, uh, I categorize it as a rule-based sandbox. Uh, what it does is basically say, uh, I restrict what the application can, can do, right? AppMO is based on the file path, while SCNUX is based on the inode. Uh, SACCOM is like, uh, just fill out the ACC course. Uh, but the, uh, the same principle over there is like, you need to set up the rules. Uh, and then let's use Linux security modules, which is the framework used by AppMO and NC Linux as an example, how it looks like. Uh, on the right side of the screen is actually an example profile for AppMO. I don't know how many good guys actually use AppMO. Uh, oh, there are some people. How many of you actually have written any profiles? Oh, that's great. Three, five, six, okay. Great, you guys are pros. Uh, so undoubtedly, this is a really, I mean, you need the pros to actually write the profile. So uh, Don Walsh actually recited his quote because I like this guy and uh, he's great. And he also created a website to uh, say stop disabling AC Linux. Why? Because people just send, uh, when you actually have problems with AC Linux, the first thing you do is probably just send enforce equal to zero. Uh, that's what people do, right? Uh, and the other side of the, uh, the other type of sandbox is called Cisco filtering. I think since 1999 or since 96 or maybe early, like since Ptrace invented people, Ptrace is really a debugging phase for, for the kernel. However, smart people have been inventing uh, sandbox around them because once you can intercept the sandbox, uh, syscalls, actually you can do certain filtering or maybe redirecting uh, the syscalls. Uh, the problem over Cisco based, uh, sorry, Ptrace based Cisco, uh, sandbox is the checking is in the user space. Uh, they are naturally just like vulnerable to temple check and temple to use uh, vulnerabilities if it's multi-threaded because you can easily trigger risk condition. And then people have been doing like Will Jury and a bunch of like Keith Cook and uh, they have been hollow working and working on the solution for Chrome OS and the Chrome browser, which is called like Suncom, uh, recently upgraded to BPF and even eBPF. Uh, the, the best part of this approach is, is in kernel. So naturally you, uh, you can copy the data, do the checking, 
and then uh, use it, right? Direction is a pointer or whatever. So we're not a software to the uh, talk to attack. Um, and the other uh, recent invention, also I think from Chrome, is they have the auto Cisco, but it's slightly inflexible uh, because they don't have the BPF instructions. Uh, if you guys are familiar with the BPF, uh, the right side has a snippet of the BPF. It's also, I mean, you need some knowledge to actually write this thing. Um, so, still not easy, right? So writing the rules is really tedious. Uh, I'm trying to cheese like Jesse here. It's like smart engineers like Jesse will automate that, right? She has made uh, great tools actually to automatically generate that and based on the static analysis of the binary. Uh, however, the rules can be also fragile. Uh, can be overfeeding, which means your application actually may break or underfeeding, which means you actually allow maybe two, more than 200 of Cisco's. Uh, I just have a friendly remember, because as a Go user, uh, you have to improve, like, uh, include EPO P weight, because it's a recent addition to the Go runtime itself. Uh, ironically, that's because Android actually only allows this Cisco. For Go to run Android, you have to use this Cisco instead of the EPO weight. Uh, Anyway, so it's a problem caused by SecCom, by, by six core filtering. Uh, then a lot of people like us, we have to fix our SecCom PPF uh, filters. At the same time, it's not completely safe because uh, you're still subject to spect uh, spectre meltdown, those kind of hardware uh, bugs. Okay, uh, then let's come to a new set of solutions. Right. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Kata containers and also clean containers and the Hyper and, the, uh, and even NoVM, uh, also coming from Google. Uh, they've been actually working on a solution uh, which is great. It's like universal, right? So it's hypervisor based. Hypervisor basically uh, base, uh, gives the strong isolation. However, the drawbacks is coming over with years. Uh, it's really heavyweight. We have actual softwares, uh, more code, right? You have more code to run, basically. And also have kind of inflexible, uh, inflexible resource boundaries. Uh, for example, when you actually launch your container, you have to tell this VM how many CPUs, how many memory you can give to this VM instead of like running your C group uh, like a native container, and then you actually increase the CPU quota or increase the memory uh, at runtime. And then let's go back to the picture again, right? So I think VM-based or hypervisor-based Security is great. We really want that. Uh, then we start analyzing what is really the key factor over there. If you look at this diagram, we maybe see on our blog post already. It's basically container layered on top of gas kernel, uh, which is independent. It's like one kernel per container or per user, per trust domain, I would say. And then you have the VMM, which actually provides the virtual hardware interface. Uh, it's arguably is a kind of more limited than the Cisco interface, uh, than exposing the host Linux directly. And also because the usage of virtualization, which actually give you a much better isolation, right, the period of isolation. So the, to summarize that, the lesson we learned is to actually at least let people to feel secure. So you have need to provide like two things. Uh, independent kernel, uh, which is actually uh, is pretty right because if you have an independent kernel, the kernel is actually is out of the trusted computing base, right? The host interface, the hypervisor itself, will become the essential attack surface, and then by applying the virtualization, um, you actually can achieve a much clear uh, privilege separation because you have additional. Uh, CPU mode, right, in the hardware. Hardware gonna guarantee that. When you actually switch that, all the MSRs gonna switch, for example. Uh, however, there are some collaterals. Uh, for example, this virtualized hardware interface. Hard virtualized hardware interface is not really, I mean, can be directly consumed by containers. Um, it speaks like our ports, interrupt, exceptions. Uh, what these things can do, actually, uh, it's, it's the OS job, right? It's the open, opening system should abstract those kind of things away. Okay, then when we apply the Linux kernel, the problem comes like, Linux is really a one size fit all solution. And when it's designed, it's really actually designed to actually to run on fixed 
number of resources because you cannot easily unplug a CPU or a memory from physical machines. And it's also monolithic. So everything in the same address space. Uh, although recently they have been uh, using KPTI, uh, kernel page table isolation, uh, page table level isolation, uh, due to the uh, meltdown. So this is our approach. I'm really excited to introduce this. Uh, we figure out, okay, how about we just keep those good ingredients from the VM solution, but without the Linux kernel. So that's why we went ahead and actually spent five years uh, developing this project. Uh, it's basically, what is GVisor here is basically a user space kernel written from scratch in Go. So, and also we have some certain uh, hypervisor, uh, hypervisor solutions as well as the P-Trace, if you uh, are familiar with that, it's basically a, the Linux native way to actually incept the Cisco's. I can talk about difference a little bit later. Uh, so we can still have the security property here, right? We have independent kernel, which is out of the TCB, and we have virtualizations for uh, state encapsulation. So what is it really? Uh, this is actually for you to sandbox on trusted applications. As I said, it's, a, it's an open system approach. We implement the Linux system APIs in user space, uh, over the 200 Cisco so far, uh, but not all the flags. We we'll basically add those flags on demand uh, when customers need that. Uh, it's pretty actually nice, actually, when you write syscalls, uh, implement this in Go. Uh, it's just like you are driving, a, I'll say, Ferrari versus like, I mean, sorry, I'm just like Go lover. Uh, but, okay, uh, so it's not a put like uh, uh, UML, because I got, uh, yesterday when we were open source, we got, uh, naturally got a lot of questions on Hacker News and uh, even GitHub and Reddit. Uh, you say, hey, this is basically a UML approach. It's, not, it's a UML style uh, interception for a P-Trace platform. And a P-Trace platform, the problem people see in P-Trace is kind of slow and uh, I would say not race-free. Uh, it's because it has a, a synchronous uh, nature when you actually accept syscalls, right? You would do a CC email and you wait, to that syscall, uh, uh, wait for that process. You involve two process there. And the GVisor, Yes, we use that model. Uh, it's just sort of to let you guys to run uh, GVisor everywhere, right? Uh, because P-Trace right now is kind of universal. Uh, not just filters, uh, as, uh, as just opposed to second PPF, because we implement those six goals in the user space, really. We implement 200, over 200 six goals, uh, almost, uh, I mean, two-thirds of the existing Linux surface, and most of the popular ones, covers, I mean, uh, a huge surface like people are gonna use by using 60 full syscalls to the host. So we also can run unmodified by Linux binaries. This is a, is a key difference between like solutions like a NACL or even people arguing about like a unikernel style thing. We can actually make a unikernel out of GVisor, but we thought like isolation is more important. Uh, also, this is uh, secure by default, right? We don't have to filter any, anything because you have over 200 syscalls to use. Uh, and we, like I said, it's an independent kernel, one kernel per sandbox. So also to know that we also building a save restore feature, uh, which is a potential actually for you to implement for us also, to implement the like, uh, library migration. Uh, to actually let people to use GVisor, uh, you cannot easily just use a kernel, right? So we created a runtime, it's an OCI based runtime. Uh, it's powered by GVisor. Basically, RunC is just an interface, implement the OCI, so we can take commands, OCI commands. And the sentry here is really the user space kernel. And we, by using the KVM, I'm just using KVM here as an example. We just intercept this course and it will trap and enter the sentry and the sentry will do certain things. Uh, sometimes we need the request like uh, host resources. Uh, we will go to the host kernel, actually, for example, um, just like get some memory, right? Just do a map. And of course, uh, we want to limit that interface. As I said, we limited to like 60 full uh, uh, syscalls. We also apply namespaces and all the rule-based uh, sandbox technologies. You can think of GVisor as basically a layered solution. Uh, that's how we actually provide isolations. Uh, and also, uh, I forgot to talk about the gopher. 
uh, and during, remember when I said, like, I did the analysis for the 20-ish uh, uh, exploit for Linux? Can you guys guess, like, what's the top Cisco's being used as an attack vector? Just a guess? No? Huh? No. The first one is socket. The second one is open. Right? They actually, uh, they took, like, uh, they actually are being, I think, almost 40% of the, of all Cisco's are being used as the attack vectors. Uh, what's the common in this for Cisco's? This com in, what's in common in Cisco's is actually those Cisco's are for users to get additional host resources. So what we learned here is actually we apply to the Sentry, we disallow socket, we disallow open. You cannot any, open any file once you load the untrusted application. But then how you actually open the files? So that's why we have the gophers. So that's why we use the 9P protocol actually to proxy through all the file system, uh, uh, all the file system operations. So even Sentry is compromised. You still cannot get any guaranteed, cannot get any uh, additional resources through open socket and even like socket pair, like uh, any like uh, the normal Linux means. And here's the numbers. Uh, it's really made for containers. Right, so we have 150, it's kind of conservative because I don't want to surprise you guys. Uh, 150 millisecond startup time. Uh, we use a bin chu here, basically start a bin chu. And uh, the memory all had because it's written from scratch, it's go, we avoid a lot of like, we basically write a lot of like a library by ourselves. And it's really 15 megabytes uh, overhead if I just run a bin sleep. Uh, if you don't believe it, you try it. And uh, also, you can use your Go, right? No fixed resources. I don't need to tell you how many CPUs you want to use, right? In case you might actually want to increase that footprint, you want to scale it up. Uh, and easy to debug. Imagine you actually have an open system can boot up in sub-second, and even you have a bug there, it's pretty easy actually to debug instead of actually waiting for a crashing machine, right? So, uh, however, there are still some cautions I want to remind you <laughs> because uh, Sandbox means the security actually not, never comes for free, right? So GVAS is really good for small containers, for serverless, for small jobs, for Node.js, those kind of things, because it spins up really quickly and it can scale up. And also for high density, you can pack a lot of jobs and the same physical machines. What is not good for trusting images, right? So you don't need these additional layers. Uh, and also Cisco heavy workload. I don't know who actually writes applications just doing Cisco's. Um, also direct access to hardware. Uh, it's not like, uh, it's just not been done yet. Um, maybe open the open source and we can work with our partners and uh, external developers actually to solve that. Uh, right now it's just not the target uh, use case. Uh, this is the, my favorite tweet like from yesterday after open source. Uh, yes, I want to answer to uh, Raymond, actually. I don't know if he's here. Uh, uh, this is actually one of the major motivation, uh, I would say early major motivation for doing GVisor because we actually want to accelerate the OS research. Uh, if you actually have any cool ideas, new ideas, if we can actually implement in user space in Go, then actually, uh, you can actually iterate much faster than you actually develop in Linux. Yes, that's actually one of the major goals. Uh, I, pr I would say this is a perfect use case for GVisor. Uh, Want to try? Please go to our GitHub page. Uh, surprisingly, we just open source like, we opened the repo uh, yesterday noon and we already got like over 2,000 stars, which is really encouraging. Uh, we have six comments to run and you are ready to go. Uh, please try it out if you see any bugs, find a bug to us. Uh, one more, we can talk to us to, at the GVisor booth. I don't know if we still have one, I don't know. Uh, also, please join the uh, mailing list. Uh, also, you can get involved and uh, maybe just join uh, Signal discussion. We, we're gonna help, uh, we're gonna hold tomorrow. And there are all more talks from Google actually talking about like what's beyond the sandbox, right? So I think there will be a lot of interesting things in, in the security pods talk like by Tim and uh, also the runtime security talk by Maya. Uh, I also want to shout out the uh, team. I think this is just showing, uh, this is a real product. <laughs> All right, so that's it, thank you.
No questions? Uh, is there any real performance data to show the, uh, the, 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 the performance degradation using like P-Trace or KVM? Uh, I don't have that uh, absolute data, but uh, what I can provide is P-Trace is definitely slower. Uh, because they inherit, like, uh, like I said, right, uh, synchronous uh, interception uh, versus KVM. Uh, you might want to try yourself because you may have a faster machine than mine. Uh, except for the performance issue, do you think the, the, the P-Trace part could provide a production, production level security? I would say the Peaches platform definitely will have a uh, certain security protection for you because the Cisco's at least is uh, going to be uh, implemented in Sentry. Even Sentry is compromised, you are still protected by the SecComp. So what can go wrong, right? So with SecComp. Uh, uh, sorry, I haven't done yet. However, if you compare against like KVM, I would say KVM definitely will give you a peace of mind, I'll put it this way, because the virtualization and also the performance, right? So if you look at this, uh, although it's still in experimental, uh, I would say uh, it's worth trying. Yeah, yeah, uh, because we are, we are working on some, something like, uh, don't use the P-Trace, but also by use some eBPF related feature to implement those part of the system called catch and uh, redirect and uh, process. So uh, if, if we use that to substitute the P-Trace part, do you think it's, it's uh, reached the, the goal of you think about the security? Uh, let me try to understand your question. So you said that you have a P-Trace plus eBPF to actually replace the... No, no, P -trace. no P-Trace, just eBPF? Uh, the problem I've heard, at least, uh, is eBPF is disabled for most like unprivileged users because eBPF actually can make a perfect gadget inside the household kernel for like a side of channel attacks. So uh, we've been thinking about that, but we have never actually spent time to evaluate what's the feasibility. But I do believe with time and resource, uh, eBPF can evolve actually maybe to a degree that we can do those kind of uh, fancy things inside Linux kernel. Um, so the uh, uh, KVM uh, platform, like it's only used to, to trap the signals, to trap the system calls, that's all? Like th this is the difference between KVM uh, platform and the... Yeah, I, I'm probably not the best person to explain the KVM. I don't know if Aiden's here. Probably not. Okay. KVM, uh, we use it differently than QMU. So we use, we definitely use the KVM to actually create, to put the CPU into the VMX down room mode. All right? to actually drop the privilege, if you think that way. However, we do use, uh, like, for example, uh, KVM, like a uh, create CPU. We create CPU on each thread creation. You can say each clone is mapped to a create CPU. And we also use EPT. Uh, we have, like, a internal page table manipulation, actually, to actually uh, map those, like, physical pages. Uh, so, uh, however, there is, uh, I'll put it this way. KVM actually for us is to provide the lower level support in terms of like the privilege separation and low level, uh, like I said, like the paging support uh, for that. That's, that's the only thing we need actually. Uh, does it scale with much processors? Do you mean actually multiple instances on the same machine? Uh, yeah. same yes, machine. yes. It's just a behavior like a regular Linux process. Uh, right? If Linux can scale, we have no problem. Uh, I think uh, usable Linux uh, doesn't support SMP, uh, but uh, how do you support? Oh, Linux, uh, the UML, the UML, I, I've heard they've uh, trying to solve this SMP. Actually, maybe inside Google, I don't know if I can talk about that. They have been trying to use like different threading models uh, for us. Uh, because we don't use any scheduler. So we don't suffer from, for example, spin logs and synchronizations. The, we basically map like one uh, application thread to one uh, go routine. So which actually just led us to use the raw go runtime scheduler. So I don't think this is a problem for us.
Okay. We can talk offline. Sorry. <laughs>